Yes. Good, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Hans Königsmann. I work for a, a small little company called SpaceX in the, uh, in the United States, in Los Angeles, <laughs> city of Hawthorne, actually. Uh, I'm going to talk about reliability and, um, sorry, I'm going to talk about reusability and how it is connected to both reliability and affordability. And uh, I will also use the uh, opportunity to show you a little bit uh, what we're doing at SpaceX. Um, maybe, maybe f I myself, I'm actually, uh, I, I worked at ZARM for um, seven years before I moved over to the US, and um, I've been with SpaceX for uh, 16 years by now. Next one, please. SpaceX uh, designs, manufactures, and launches advanced rockets and spacecraft. That is basically um, what we do. It's not uh, uh, necessarily what our goal is. Our goal is um, to enable people to live on other planets, and in particular, we're looking at Mars. Um, and, and everybody knows this. We have these Occupy Mars uh, t-shirts and uh, pushing, pushing the uh, multi-planetary species as much as we can. We have about 100 missions on the manifest, and uh, that represents a value of about $12 billion. We are working on those missions to fly them. Thank you. And um, we are the only company right now with the capability to land and refly orbital rockets, and that is very important. This picture here is uh, Falcon Heavy. I'm going to talk about Falcon Heavy a little bit later on. Um, yeah. So one of the reasons I'm here is um, I uh, not, am, not only have I worked at Bremen and at ZAM for many years, but um, I also came back in 2003. And uh, we were at the IAC here, and the IAC was uh, friendly enough to give us a, a small room and, uh, and a paper, basically. And, and that is the paper here. And uh, let's see, let me show. It has a couple a couple of funny things on it. Um, one of them is uh, it's, it's talking about Falcon 1. It's a little bit different than it looked be, uh, in the end. Uh, it talks about a <laughs> what looks like a little heavy <laughs> with a Falcon 1, basically, which I thought was really funny. And it's hard to see down there, but the uh, stage 1 splashdown, that was our initial way of, uh, of proposing how you can reuse rockets. Huh? And again, this is 15 years ago. Um, so I, I basically want to show you what happened over 15 years, and uh, my, my, my goal is then in, to come in 15 years again and tell you what happened in the next 15 years. Um, also, one thing that's funny is um, both Elon and Gwyn were actually at the meeting here, and uh, we basically got no attention at all. We were just quietly walking around and looking at other people's hardware. This is where we are today. Uh, we have our headquarters in, uh, in Hawthorne, in California. Uh, we have launch sites in uh, Vandenberg and in uh, NASA Kennedy Space Center and Cape Canaveral. And uh, there's actually a difference between Cape Canaveral and, uh, and, and KSC uh, Kennedy Space Center. And it's not just uh, two different names. It's actually the, uh, the north part is, Cape, uh, is Kennedy Space Center and belongs to NASA. And the, uh, the southern part is uh, Cape Canaveral Air Force Station and belongs to the Air Force. Excuse me. <clears throat> it sounds like a, like a small distinction, but it's actually very important. We have two launch pads there. We have the, um, what's called um, pad 40, or LC40, which is the upper right pad. Um, we usually launch uh, GTOs from there. And then we have... Um, where is the other pad? KSC down there, the, the second one. I think I have an extra slide on that. That's where we fly heavy and the uh, crewed mission from. And um, the pads are uh, maybe six, seven miles apart, but they have other regulations. The regula regulations are different when I launch from KSC than if I launch from, from, the, uh, from the Air Force Station. And so you can't just uh, switch and, uh, and, and change things very quickly. You have to, you have to work you have to basically move the paperwork at the same time. Uh, let's see, other places that are important for us, McGregor. McGregor is a test site. I'm going to have an extra slide on that, too. It's uh, super important for us. We are a, a testing company. We, we trust our tests more than we do our, our analysis, basically. And even if we trust our analysis, we verify with the test. 
Um, and then we have a couple other, we have an office in Houston, you have an office in DC, everybody has to have an office in DC. Um, we have a, a, a beginning launch site in South Texas and we have another office in, in Redmond. Um, this is a really unusual picture. And I, I looked at it this morning, I tried to prep myself a little bit um, for, this, for this presentation. I looked at it and go, this looks wrong. There's no person on there. It's, um, yeah, I don't think I see anybody. But, but usually this is a beehive. Yeah? Everybody who has been at SpaceX, it's, it's a beehive of people that are running and, and getting stuff done. And, uh, and it's, it's, really, it's really very distinct from other um, integration facilities that I've seen because there's just so much going on. Yeah? These are three rows, basically, and they're actually five lanes. And the, uh, the booster is, uh, this here is the, the corner, in the corner there is the welding machine, that's a friction steel welding machine, where we basically built the, the rocket. The second station there is a, a spray booth where we paint the rocket at the same time, and out comes a uh, more or less uh, finished tank, and then the tank gets uh, integrated with other hardware as we go down the, uh, the lanes. At the very last lane, we put the the uh, nine engines on there, and then we put the whole thing on wheels and, uh, and drive it out to uh, Texas for the test. Uh, we have pretty much all designers on, in that facility. It's a pretty big facility, but um, it, it, it turned into a campus. We have, um, I don't know how many. I think the building number, the highest one I know is 29. So we must have 20 or something buildings in that. In that. I haven't been at all the buildings, and I've been there for 16 years. Um, I've, I've heard that the biggest building that we have is uh, 500,000 square feet, and all the others basically have, mere, have more square fo footage than the, uh, the biggest building. So it's a pretty large operation by now. Um, we also have uh, testing laboratories on board, um, and then, then we have mission control actually right there. This is, this is really fascinating. Mission control is a, uh, has, a, has a large glass wall. You, you, you might have seen this in some of the, uh, the videos. This is the actual mission control for Dragon, yeah? And you can basically, um, from the cafeteria, you can look right into mission control and, and see what's going on. Um, in terms of Texas, this is the uh, facility in Texas. It's pretty large. Mostly what you need is uh, you need area, you need um, distance from population, so uh, you don't bother people when you, when you test rocket engines. I think one of the rocket test engine sites is over there blowing this way. Um, by now, it's actually pretty big. Uh, it has probably four or 500 people, I think. Um, and then here, I think this is a grasshopper or an F9R, and there's the grasshopper. So uh, it's a really interesting little uh, test facility right in the middle of Texas near, near Baco. Uh, this is the, the launch site I talked earlier, uh, LC-39. LC-39 is a, a, a super historical launch site. Um, I believe most Apollo missions, most shuttle, the majority of the shuttle missions launched from, from this launch pad. And um, I, as a child, always looked at this launch pad in awe. Uh, and in fact, as a student, I was there and uh, I was still in awe. And now today I can actually go there and swipe my badge and just go into the launch pad. That's pretty, uh, that's pretty cool for me, I think. Um, the, uh, this one here, the, this is the clean room for, or the integration room. I think it's called the white room. Um, for the shuttle, by now we basically took it down and, and moved it out because we don't need that. And um, uh, the tower, the remaining tower, has now a uh, a bridge up here. The bridge is basically the uh, the walkway to the uh, Crew Dragon for the astronauts. Yeah, and then this is the hangar that uh, puts the Falcon Heavy together or a, or the the, the Crew Dragon. Um, this launch pad is primarily for uh, Crew Dragon and for Falcon Heavy, uh, but we can, also fal we can also launch just any, any Falcon 9 there if we want, if we, we have to. The other launch pad is, uh, is another six miles uh, south of that. And the, the funny thing is there's still, there's still tours that NASA does. Yeah? I mean, uh, NASA doesn't launch the shuttle anymore, but the tours are still there. There's still tour buses going around and, and, and showing the, uh, the new pad, I think this one, and then in the... Uh, and the distance is uh, 39B. Um, yeah, so this is actually um, almost exactly 10 years ago. It was uh, 10 years, we celebrated 10 years orbital um, flight on September 28, a couple of days ago, basically. 
And, um, and uh, I remember this very well. This is a launch from a, uh, from a small island called Omelek, which is part of the Kwajalein Atoll, which is part of uh, an army base in the Marshall Islands. And uh, if you have time later on, you might just look it up and see how far away it is in the middle of nothing. We, uh, <coughs> we, we failed on the first three vehicles. Um, we learned our lesson there. We, we learned how to build rockets, and then we, we flew this one successfully, and, uh, and that basically is where the story of SpaceX actually really uh, took off. By that time, we, we got this building. The building was huge in the beginning. In fact, it was so big that we, uh, that we parked the cars inside and would just walk over to the, to the office. That time is actually gone. Um, my office is now pretty much where I used to park my car. <laughs> yeah, we, by the time we, uh, we went orbital, we had 618 employees. We, we took a picture of all the ones that remain um, uh, last week, and it's pretty amazing how many are still there. It's, uh, it's pretty impressive, I think. And uh, yeah. There's a lot that happened in between. Um, I, I just want to mention a few things. Um, I hope I get this right. Uh, in 2010, we uh, flew the first COTS mission and the first Dragon on a Falcon 9. Yeah? So we went from a Falcon 1 straight to a Falcon 9, which is a in so much more bigger vehicle than a Falcon 1. A Falcon 1, you can literally get your arms around. It's uh, six feet, what's that? That's uh, one, one, 1 1.8 meters, basically. Falcon 9 is a, is a, is a 12-footer. It's a huge vehicle compared to, to the Falcon, Falcon 1. It has nine engines, and these engines are a lot more powerful. Um, in, let's see, if I get this right, we landed our first booster in 2016. I think it was, uh, sorry, in 2015, just at the end of it. Uh, see if I get this right. I think it was the end of 2015, in December, when we, we landed the first booster. And then uh, we, we reused our first booster um, in 2017. And then earlier this year, we, we got um, Falcon Heavy, actually, um, for the first time in orbit with a mission that, uh, that was also um, probably very popular. That's the uh, Tesla to Mars, basically. Um, and by now, we are 6,000 plus, maybe 7,000. So I don't really have the latest number, but a, a fairly big company. Um, we, I must say, we, we're trying to keep the company small, but it is a lot of work, and we obviously need people for that. Um, but in general, uh, you can see that our growth tapered off a little bit and, uh, and tries to remain more or less constant. Yeah, so this is um, what we launched. We had 62 successful launches up to up to today, um, we, uh, <laughs> we did 34 of these in the last two, in 2017 and 2018, so not even in the last two years. And then uh, from 2017 to today, we had um, 34 of these launches. So I, it might have been 32, I'm not sure. I think it's 30, 34. Um, I, I need my, my notes under it <laughs> for that. Um, and and it's so hard to keep up, I, I couldn't even find the last one so quickly, and just decided there's one more and one more. So, and out of these um, 62 launches, we landed 28 times the booster. And we used that booster 15 times again, and flew, or flew it again 15 times. So far, we've only flown booster twice. Um, beginning uh, soon, we will start flying booster three times, and then take it to four times, five times, and so on and so forth. Um, we have obviously, we're very careful in, 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 uh, in evaluating boosters that come back after multiple flights. I want to make sure that we don't see wear and tear in the, in the, in the wrong spots. All right, the vehicles we have, um, there's Dragon. I'm going to talk about Dragon a little bit later. Uh, we have Falcon 9. Uh, there's two versions, basically. There's the fairing version, and there's the Dragon version. Uh, very similar, and then there's Falcon Heavy. Falcon Heavy is basically a um, uh, two side boosters that are very similar to a first stage. Have a different, um, they have a nose cone instead of a, a, a fairing. See, it's the same. But but then the rest of it is pretty much the same. The center core has slight uh, modification uh, for being a center core. Um, performance wise, um, I mean these are a lot of numbers. I just want to point out maybe, let's see. 
and I'm actually more used by now to the, uh, to the uh, uh, British units, unfortunately. The, the, the SI units are almost uh, not, not intuitive for me anymore, but it's, uh, it's 55 tons, uh, sorry, 550 tons total, and the payload um, to, to Leo is in the order of 20 plus tons. Um, payload to Mars is four tons. I, I have an extra table for the payload to GTO because that is a, a slightly more complicated story. On the Falcon Heavy side, uh, obviously roughly more than, than three times, uh, 63 tons to, to Leo, um, 17 tons to, to Mars. Uh, those are good numbers, um, pretty, pretty uh, solid performance. It's the heaviest rocket right now in operation. Um, there aren't too many customers with it, basically. There's a couple uh, national uh, uh, payloads that are, that are basically scheduled for that, and then there are some, some very heavy um, GTO um, satellites that, that would need a Falcon Heavy, but it's, it's actually not very many. Our workhorse, isn't, uh, our workhorse is, the, is the Falcon 9 at, this, at these days. And um, you can see that the, uh, this is the GTO performance, and it does vary a little bit. And, and I use this also to point out what, um, what uh, recovery or, or reusability, uh, there's, a, there's a penalty that you pay for performance, obviously. Yeah? You, um, you return to the launch site, you can launch um, three and a half tons. You launch at the drone ship, you can launch five and a half tons. Uh, and and if, you, if you expand the rocket completely, you're at six and a half, six and a half, and I think we've actually flown, flown slightly more than that too. So um, depending on, on what you do with the booster, um, that drives your, your performance on, on, the, um, on the vehicle. Now, I must say that in, 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 the most, in the most cases, we actually have satellites that are in the first to second range. I mean, most satellites are just simply designed in that range, um, five tons, that seems to be the sweet spot. Um, and uh, for that matter, it's, uh, it's, it's actually a, a vehicle that is, that is designed pretty well for the, for the GTO market. Falcon Heavy uh, is between 8,000 if you, <laughs> the landing story is a little bit more difficult because you have so many things that land, need to land and, on, on, on different places, right? Uh, the side boosters land on land and the center goes to the drone ship. Um, and I, I show you a video of how this actually looks later. All on the drone ship, um, you can go to 10 tons. Um, but we actually don't have more than two drone ships at this point in time. We would need to figure out how we do this on three. And then obviously, if expandable, you can go 15,000 and way higher. Um, yeah. Um, just briefly about Dragon. The uh, current Dragon version, or this is the, uh, I don't want to say old Dragon, but maybe I say Dragon 1. Uh, Dragon 1 is on the left side. Uh, the solar arrays are on, the, uh, on, the, on what's called the trunk. And um, <clears throat> the trunk is actually a pretty unique um, feature on Dragon, as is the feature that we can take stuff down. So we, we have, this is a, a capsule, oops, sorry. This is a capsule that can go up and down, and, uh, and it, it lands in the water, and we then pick it up and, uh, and unload it um, in the harbor and, and turn the cargo back to NASA. Yeah? So <clears throat> pretty, uh, pretty unique capability. Uh, we're the only vehicle that can do that right now uh, with the station. Um, until this Dragon number two comes online. Um, Dragon number two is the crew version. We are, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, but it, you can see it's, it looks like a Dragon, basically, but it has um, different features. It has big, bigger engines in here. These are the escape engines. Uh, they, they can be used to basically pull the capsule away in case there's something happening with the rocket that uh, we don't like. And then a couple of numbers, uh, six tons up and three tons down. Uh, this, those are roughly the, the house numbers for, for payload uh, capability. So why reusability, why are we so um, fixated or almost obsessed with the reusability? Um, I've actually tried to come up with something that is like a rocket, something that costs like 50 plus million dollar and then you throw it out after one time. And I couldn't, I couldn't find anything. Um, I can find like cheap stuff that you use once. Napkins, um, something like that. Or, but, but anything that is like a, a vehicle, I, I don't know if there are vehicles that you just use once and throw them out. 
Uh, there used to be some gliders in the, in the military um, that were only like one-time gliders that would land and then basically crash. But, but I, I really, maybe anybody knows something, but uh, tell me later, but I don't really know a high-value object that you use once and then that's pretty much it. Um, maybe some military uh, uh, hardware. But um, the, 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 the problem on the other side is if you want to reuse a rocket, you have to actually get it back. And uh, the rocket is moving down with like a certain speed. And let's, let's just look at the first stage. The speed downrange might be two kilometers per second. You have to null this and get it back and then actually land it, and that takes a lot of performance out, right? Um, the other alternative is you land forward. Well, that's a, um, that's a re-entry in the atmosphere, and you've got to design the rocket for that. It sounds, um, it sounds pretty easy to say, design the rocket for re-entry, but what actually happens is that people design the rocket for performance to orbit originally, and then in many cases you have an add-on um, you know, heat shield or something like that. That is something that we did not do in this particular case. We actually designed, we looked at what burns up in the, in the orbital entry, and then we basically protected stuff um, more and more and more and designed the rocket such that it actually survives the re-entry in a condition that you can launch it again. That's the other important part. You, you could do reusability, and then let's say you throw all the engines out or something like that, yeah? Um, that does not, that doesn't really help you because then you spend probably as much money as on a new rocket. So you got to have the um, rocket recovered and reused with minimal refurbishment. And minimal is, is probably in the beginning more like a, an inspection, a maintenance thing. But as you go along, it should be less and less. Um, uh, and, and you should basically learn what you, what you see and improve the rocket at the same time. Um, okay, let me see if I got all, all my points here. Yeah, there's another thing. You actually, um, one of the problems is uh, fatigue. You got to watch the, the life cycle on components. They, they vibrate, basically, and you got to have an eye on fracture control and, and, and make sure that you don't have any fractures on those components. That is actually not new. Helicopters do this right now very much, to, very much so. They are basically um, flying vibration machines and they track actually the number of cycles and they know exactly when they have to go into maintenance or preventive maintenance. Um, something similar is, uh, is what we can do here on, on a rocket. We can basically record the flight load and then log this to the history of the part and then we can figure out when the part has to be exchanged, if it actually has to be exchanged. Ideally, you do not want to change parts. Um, the, the, the problem with the market and the expandable launch vehicles, I, I listened to the talk earlier, and um, <laughs> it's, um, there's very little incentive for a company to build a reusable vehicle because the business model of, launch, of building these for a certain amount of money and throwing them away seems so much easier. Yeah, you, you, you basically, once you build it, you just fly it, uh, you, will, you will not get as much money. However, if you build it every time new, you get, um, you get money every time. So clearly, there's very little incentive to actually change this. It's a little bit, uh, yeah, a, a matter of incentives. Um, the, the other thing is, of course, you can improve rockets. There's no question. You can build better rockets or worse rockets. Um, the, uh, uh, it, the improvements you make are gradual. They're going to be like slightly better rockets than the last one. And you might actually save some money. You might save a little bit over here or a little bit over there. And you might actually produce a slightly cheaper product. Yeah? But it's only slightly cheaper. And that's the, that's the really crucial part. The, uh, using reusability and, and putting reusability in your, in, your, in your business model is a game-changing thing. You can suddenly be so much more um, effective without producing all the time rockets. For us, it enables us. It has enabled us to suddenly jump up in the in the launches that we have from like, right, like 10 or maybe 15 in one year, and then suddenly we jump up to over 20 and basically 34 in, in the last uh, uh, two calendar years. That's that is for us the enabling part on on reusability. Okay, I do want to point out we um, this didn't happen overnight. We worked on this for many many years. 
and we, we, we put a lot of money in there, and it's our own money that we put in there. Um, there's, a, um, there's an additional benefit or a side effect um, in addition to just the economics of reusability. And, and that's basically, you look at the, uh, the booster after the flight, and you can find things that you wouldn't see otherwise. Uh, you may see uh, where stuff leaks or where uh, heat comes through or something like that. Yeah? You may find loose uh, joints that were tight before that you need to protect more. And, and, and this kind of thing is actually incredibly valuable to make a more reliable, reliable rocket. You can actually inspect it better. In fact, you get, uh, if, you, if you don't know what's happening, you can just put, just put a GoPro on the, on the, uh, on the place and, and watch it during launch. Yeah, that's what we do. We just uh, pull it out then and watch it and go, OK, that seems to be OK. Or we figure out this is something that needs to be, uh, needs to be reinforced. Yeah? Um, telemetry is, is typically limited by bandwidth. We just lock the telemetry locally, too, just in case. And, uh, and we get all the high-speed data right there from, from, a, uh, from a solid state, basically, on the vehicle, and, um, and use that to look at all the loads that the vehicle sees, all the data that are important to us, and try to improve the vehicle based on those data. So there's not just the economic part. There's also the part that I'm interested in, actually. I, uh, uh, my, my job is, is, uh, is reliability, and reliability benefits tremendously from reusability. It's a little bit like if you get your car, it's probably less on a car than mobile and airplane. If you get your airplane from a, from a shop, you're super careful the first time you fly it, because it's just been taken apart, right? On the other side, if you flew it yesterday, you're pretty much sure it's in the same condition. Yeah, so pre-flown actually means more than just avoiding the word used. It actually means that we've tested this vehicle as we fly it. In fact, we actually flew it, and then we fly it again. So how do you bring a booster back? Um, yeah, like I said, there's two versions. One of them is um, the drone ship landing, and uh, when we do that, this is Vandenberg. We typically are a little bit um, west of the, uh, the landing site. The trajectory goes roughly this way. And then, and then the, on the return, we have a slightly different azimuth. This is largely driven by um, shipping lanes, and, uh, and uh, there's some, some environmental factors that we, we can use certain areas, but not other areas, which I always find ironic, because we don't dump the booster. We actually catch it. The whole point is to not have the booster land on the land. Um, actually, just for your orientation, Hawthorne is right there. And, and that, that thing here is Los Angeles. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, let's see. So on the, uh, on the Cape side, um, it's a little bit uh, different. You fly this way, and then the, dr the, the drone ship just sits out east and, uh, and actually can go further out and, and, and just uh, sit there. We also have two landing zones there. Uh, they're, they're literally maybe 400 feet or uh, 150 meters apart. Um, they call them landing zone one and three, and then you saw on the other one, you saw landing zone four. I don't know what happened to landing zone three. Um, nobody. <clears throat> so here's what you do. When you land on, uh, this is the drone ship landing, you basically, this is the ascent. You have stage separation. You just keep going. So, um, you turn the vehicle around. You may do a boost back burn or not. You don't have to do a boost back burn. If you, if you go to Vandenberg, you, you boost back um, just a little bit. But if you do this at the Cape, you may not do this. This, is, uh, this obviously needs propellant, so you, you, you may want to avoid it. The thing what we do is we deploy these, uh, these grid fins here, and then we do an entry burn. The entry burn is equivalent a little bit to um, when, when you see the biggest entry load. Just before that, we tap the brakes. Yeah? So we take the edge of the entry by doing a burn right there. Um, we get through the, the, uh, the entry. We, we have a phase that we call aerodynamic guidance, and you will see this in the video. Um, and then we go into a vertical landing where we, le where we light one engine, typically. Um, and then this engine um, lands the, uh, the booster on the drone ship. The drone ship is small. I, I show you a little bit later how, how big it is. It's not very big. Yeah, that's the drone ship. Um, the, uh, I think I got the number, it's 200 by 150 feet. Um, divide this by three, four meters. So it's, uh, 
it's like 70 by, 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 by maybe 50 or something like that, yeah? And, um, and this is 60 feet. 20 meters of that is the, the, the span on the, on the, on the feet. It's, it's an incredible pre precise landing. Um, that is the first video, and that can have the sound. That's on the drone ship. It's actually moving. That can have the sound. It lands on the ship, and, and typically we see a little bit of fire down here, and I, I cut it long enough so we can see the fire actually goes out. It doesn't burn forever. Um, but uh, we, vent, we vent the uh, helium up there. We do some purchase over there. Um, the whole thing basically then goes into an automatic sequence that, um, that unloads the vehicle, saves it, and, and we, then, we then tie it down on the, on the ship and bring it back to port. So I had to just, I picked the wrong video. This one just burns a little bit longer. And I just want to show you that it actually does go out. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I've sat on console often enough and would say this. <laughs> you know, go out. <laughs> Let's see where we are. Ah, that's good enough. <laughs> All right, torn ship. Um, nobody is allowed to say barges <laughs> because barges don't have engines, and uh, and this this thing has four engines, and uh, and that's why it's not a barge; it's a drone ship. But we built them from barges. Um, we we actually the, the the barges originally is a little bit long longer than than wide, and then we put like wings on the two sides, so it becomes more of a square, and then we put the thrusters on there, um, and then we put um, all these instrument. Uh, containers on there. They have GPS. They have um, power. They have generators. They have um, uh, gases. Um, they have everything that you need in order to 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 service the vehicle and make sure that it's uh, happy when you when you land. The ships are called. One of them is called Just Read the Instruction, and the other one is called Of Course I Still Love You. And um, it sounds crazy in the beginning, but I actually read the book um, Ian Banks, uh, Player of Games. And, and these are, he talks about ships that uh, um, name themselves, <laughs> and those are two of the ships in the book, and uh, it makes perfect sense to me now. The, uh, yeah, the booster after, after landing is vented, uh, saved, secured on the ship. Uh, there's something that we work on right now that basically looks like a, like a, like a monster Roomba and, and, and ties the vehicle down, it's still in work. And then we ship the whole thing, we, we, we ship it back to Cape Canaveral or to uh, San Pedro in, uh, in Los Angeles. I'm always excited if it goes to San Pedro because I live there. Um, so this is how you go to land, and that's actually a little bit more dramatic. Um, you do have an ascent burn, and then after the ascent, you, you can see this in the, in, the, in the camera on the second stage. The first stage, as soon as the engine on the sec of the second stage is out, the first stage starts moving. It's, it's, it's rotating as fast as it can. The, the engine goes out and it goes right away. And um, it actually rotates so fast that we have to light the engine to catch it. Uh, we, 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 we light the engine and then basically just arrest the, the rotation rate and, uh, and fly back. And the reason is logical. You, you, you're moving the wrong way with basically two kilometers, maybe 1.8, maybe 1.7 kilometers per second. Yeah? And every second that you go the wrong way counts. You want to go the other way. Yeah? So we then fire, this is the boost back burn. We, we, um, we move the, uh, the uh, landing point back to, to land. This is a a uh, 40 second burn roughly, maybe 35, depends on where you are. Um, and then it does the same thing as the forward landing. It goes to the re-entry burn where we tap the brake pretty quickly, um, and then we go through the um, vertical landing and so on and so forth. Um, I think I have a video of that. Oh, wait a second. Uh, first I have this. This is actually a picture, and this, uh, this guy makes awesome pictures, John Kraus. Um, he, uh, he, Everything that, that I wanted to explain is on this picture. There's the shutdown. There's the boost back burn. There's stage two. I actually think 
This little gap there is the fairing. I can't prove it, but uh, I think that's what it is. Um, that's the entry burn, and that's the landing burn. It's all there. It's one of the, the, the best pictures I've seen to, to explain this whole thing. Um, this one, no sound on this one. Um, this one starts with the entry burn, and this is a CRS, uh, CRS mission. This is the end of the entry burn. And this is by, by a tracking camera that is really high power, so it's, it's really good to see how this thing comes, comes, uh, comes into the atmosphere back. By the time of the entry burn, um, you have roughly Mach 2.6-ish, and it goes slightly up after that. Um, and that happens in about, uh, I think it ends at 40 kilometers, something like that. Yeah. Um, and then it basically goes through this aerodynamic uh, phase. You can see it has, a, uh, it has an angle of attack, it's slightly, slightly, um, slightly up, basically. The green stuff that you see is T-tap. That's the, uh, the ignition fluid that we use. The, 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 the flame that goes a little bit like uh, up and down, that is the, uh, the GG, the gas generator flame. Um, the, main, the main flame just goes straight down. And unfortunately, in this one, you're going to miss the landing because it's behind a tree. But uh, I wanted to show you the, uh, the, uh, the entry phase, uh, the initial entry phase. This one actually is funny. It, it bumps a little bit. Uh, it jumps a little bit up again. You can see this. Hang on. There. Yeah, I saw the little jump at the end. That's because the engine shuts off, but probably two feet or something like that is still in the air. And that's it. That's how it looks. Oh, sorry, I didn't want to do that. Here we go. I, I put another picture in so you can actually see it. Um, some of these landings look uh, serial and, and, and uh, very, very... Um, people have said that this looks fake. I have to admit, it does almost. It's, uh, it looks so so good, <laughs> especially the the twin landing that we had. So, when it comes to Falcon Heavy, the whole thing gets complicated, right? You have two side boosters that uh, go back to land. You have a a forward booster that goes back to the drone ship, and then you have a second stage that does something else. You have four vehicles basically in the air, and um, this was really fun, I must say. Um, There's <laughs> really action in those in those ten minutes, not just uh, one vehicle going this way and and disappearing in the ocean. Um, uh, that's a lot happening on a Falcon Heavy landing, but essentially it is a um, supposedly a center core landing on the on the um, drone ship, and I'm going to show you a video on that later on. Um, and then two two side boosters landing on the on the two landing zones that we have next to each other. That's the that's how it looks on the on the on the landing. I, as, like I said, I'm going to give you a video of that later on. Um, we then pick the side boosters up, and it's called broken over, and it's transported to the hangar. Well, that means, of course, I, I told you earlier, we save the vehicle, we vent it, and so on and so forth. We do the same thing on land, obviously. That's, that's part of the program. I mean, uh, the, the, the thing has a sequence basically programmed on board, and saving it at the end, putting the, the, the grid fins back in is part of it too, right? Um, and, uh, and in the hangar, we do inspections and checkouts, and we have certain um, uh, refurbishment programs, depending on which booster that is. If, is it the booster that's the, uh, the life leader is a little bit different. Um, and depending on what we find in the inspections, we do certain, certain uh, uh, refurbishment, or we, we just um, don't do it this time, do it next time. Uh, and then we go into a static fire, then we launch it again, and then the majority of the work actually is on the engines, the thermal protection system, and the aero covers. The aero cover is the, um, I think that basically is the, the raceway on the side. Yeah? We do look into the tanks to make sure there's no, uh, no surprises in the tank, and so far we've, we found only clean tanks on the inside. Um, we sometimes see damage from, from the thermal protection system impacting the aero covers, um, so they are reinforced, and, and we make sure that we don't break anything on landings. Um, let's see what else. Yeah, we have a long-term plan to reduce the refurbishment to routine inspection and periodic, periodic maintenance. But in order to do this, you need to collect data and you need to collect experience that you can say, based on the data, I, can, I have to look at this, but I don't have to look at this part. Yeah. It's a lot of, um, 
flight experience based in, in that, obviously, and how you, how you, divide, how you um, design your maintenance program, basically. Um, there's another thing that we actually recover. We recover the fairing. And I, I haven't talked too much about it. We're not quite done with it. Um, the fairing is actually great to recover because the shape is, um, is so good for re-entry. You don't need a lot of um, thermal protection system. You need a little bit on the top of it anyways. And, um, and, and if you put the, the fairing basically with the broad side into the flow, you, you, get a, uh, you have a body that has a, I always mix it up with that it's a low or high ballistic factor, but it's a large area and a low weight. So um, I think that's a low ballistic factor, right? Um, and basically what it does, it, it goes to the reentry in a very benign way. It doesn't have a lot of um, local centralized uh, heat load. Um, by the time it slows down, uh, we, we deploy a parafoil. And then the, the plan is to steer it, basically, and to, uh, to land it on the ship. And I have a picture of that ship, too. Before I show you the picture, um, we land them in the water right now. And this one looks, for example, um, phenomenal in my eyes. This, this, is just, a, um, this just went through a re-entry and, um, and, and the landing. And, and there's, there's no visible damage at all on this, on this, on this piece of equipment. Um, this is the boat. <laughs> um, it looks a little bit crazy, but uh, it, it does make sense. Um, there's the, the net, basically. Is, uh, the boat is supposed to go in, 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 in the same direction, and then the, 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 the fairing uh, lands on, on the net and then gets lowered and uh, taken on board, basically. Uh, the boat is called Mr. Stephen. It's, uh, it's really fast, a pretty, pretty fast boat. And um, down here are the, the uh, net deployment tests in the San Pedro Harbor. My house is somewhere on the back side there. Um, the other thing that we, rec uh, we, we recover and fly again is Dragon. Um, I put the Dragon 2 capsule in here. This is the, um, what was it called? Um, I think it was in the board system test uh, that we did two years ago on, uh, on, on Crew Dragon, uh, simply because it looked so much prettier than the other Dragon. It's nice and shiny and not burned up. Uh, parachutes are much nicer too. Um, the, I already mentioned that on Dragon, it's the only vehicle that can bring significant amounts of payload down from the International Space Station. The trunk is also a unique capability. Um, and I explained a little bit why that is. Um, it's um, when, you, when you put something in the station, you have to go through the, the hatches, and they have a certain size. And if you want to put something outside on the station, it's actually not that easy to do that. Yeah? The easiest part is to leave it outside and then have the robotic arm go into the trunk and just pull it out and put it somewhere on the, on the, uh, on the station itself. And you can put stuff up there that is way bigger than the hole would be on the hatch. Yeah? Uh, and so we have payloads in there that are um, either sensors or ca cameras. Um, there was an HD camera on there that would just transmit what the, the station sees at the moment. So there's a lot of, we, we, we changed uh, some of the heat uh, not heat exchanger. I think I forgot exactly about the. Uh, basically, all the bigger hardware that's outside of the station um, can be brought up with that um, with that system, and it's, I think it's it's actually really cool. Um, Dragon then and Dragon One actually returns to the West Coast um, and is unloaded at the port of Los Angeles and then sent to Texas and then we refurbish it in Texas. Um, we. It's a little bit more work to refurbish Dragon at this point in time because it lands on the salt water. You've got to be, be super careful with that, obviously. But inside, there's a pressure, um, pressure container, and that, is, uh, that can be basically used very easily. The uh, Dragon 2, and that's why I wrote this one, actually lands on the, uh, on the east coast. So Crew Dragon will land on the other coast. Uh, I think that's a video. I'm not sure which one it is. Right, this is the Dragon video. I, I, I just cut that out of um, the other videos. This is the mission control in, in Hawthorne. A little bit of Falcon 9 launches. I just want to show basically what Dragon actually does here. This is the separation. You can see the payloads in the trunk. It's too fast. This is where it, uh, it gets grappled by the station. It doesn't, it doesn't dock, it, uh, it grapples, and then it gets berthed. And that's how they attach it, basically. 
There it is. And that's actually is the unberthing. That's now from the station and, and Dragon leaving. I don't think we have good footage of the landing, and I don't think we have to... Um, this one actually is interesting because you can see a little bit the, the angle. We have a leeward and a um, windward side, and there's uh, dragonflies at, the, at an angle of attack. It's actually slightly uh, lifting body. All right, so this is how the new dragon looks inside. Um, we're getting close to that. Uh, we, uh, we're working hard to get this done this year, but uh, at this time, the, the hardware might be ready. We might still have to do some work on the paper, uh, on the paperwork and certification side of it. Um, it's going to be a close call whether we fly this year or not. Uh, that's my second to last one. I wanted to throw BFR in there because I'm probably getting questions from you about BFR. Yeah? Um, I know basic things about BFR. I've seen parts of it. I'm, I'm in awe about the size. I think this is a, an amazing rocket. <laughs> and I think um, the, reason, the reason we build it is actually we need more, more tonnage and, and space in order to get to Mars. And we are serious about going to Mars. And that's why we start building BFR. Um, that is the, uh, that's called the BFS. That's the Big Falcon ship. The other one is the Big Falcon rocket, as you probably know, right? Um, this is Falcon Heavy, and uh, I want to just show you that. That needs some sound. There you go. To the girl with the mousy hair. That's a Tesla. But her mommy is yelling no. And her daddy that's a Tesla on the to go. That's a Tesla on the Tesla. But her friend is nowhere to be seen. Now she walks through that thing is pretty big too. Dream. To the seat with the clearest view. And she's hooked to the silver screen But the film is a sad thing for For she's lived it ten times or more She could spit in the eyes of fools If they ask her to focus on sailors Fighting in the dance hall Somebody asked me yesterday what I think is the biggest thing we did in those 15 years. And to me, it's actually that we got people excited about this, that we have people watching launches again, that people come, there's people that came from all over the world to watch this launch. And watching a launch is a little bit like, I don't know, like a rare borealis. You never know what's really happening, right? Um, they took the risk, they bought the ticket, they went there and they camped out there and, uh, and watch this launch. And that's, in my eyes, it's a little bit like how I envisioned how it was in the 60s. And we had Apollo and uh, went to the moon. And so the biggest thing for me is that we actually get people excited, that we, we, have, we have the ability to re-energize this whole thing. Rockets, payloads, economics, it's all important at the end of the day, but getting people excited and getting to the point where we actually all work on this is, in my eyes, way more of an achievement than anything else what we've done. Um, I do want to point out on this video, I think this is uh, the crew did an awesome job putting the video together. Um, the other crew did an awesome job putting the, the Falcon Heavy um, rocket together. That's, uh, we have an amazing crew working in, in, in Hawthorne and at the Cape and Vandenberg and all the other places of SpaceX. And I just want to say, I want to say thank you to those people that uh, joined SpaceX, that helped SpaceX, that are interested in SpaceX. Um, thank you very much.
we have some time for questions. Please, um, my hearing is not great, <laughs> so I need you to yell. And, um, and, uh, and I also have only 10 minutes, I think, or maybe even less. 10 minutes. Yes, please. Oh, the question what? is, what are the main obstacles for SpaceX other than the gravity well? Um. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question, actually. Um, getting a rocket together. So I'll tell you something. We, 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 are, we are privately financed. And I know there's people here that, that, that claim that it's not true, but it's true. We are privately financed. Yeah? Obviously, we need private financing. We do not want subsidies. It, help, it keeps us private money, keeps us hungry. Um, we, we do not do um, cost plus, we do not do time plus, uh, whatever these cont contacts are called, um, that you basically get a blank check and just you know, work until it's done. <laughs> um, we, we do want to have an upper limit, yeah? and, and we have um, uh, fixed, uh, what's it called? Fixed, uh, fixed cost contracts, basically. Yeah? I'm not a contract person, obviously. Yeah? And, and as long as we keep that spirit, as long as we do that, I, I feel like there are no obstacles. It's just a matter of time to get over it. Uh, yes, please. Oh, you got a microphone. Very good. Okay, uh, so I got a question regarding the uh, Block 5 version of the Falcon 9. The what? Uh, Block 5. Uh, so how is it uh, performing? Are you happy with the refurbishment? Uh, and, uh, you know, how, it's, uh, how is the state of the rocket after the flight? Yeah, so I'm, um, I'm actually surprised. On the, the logic was a little bit the engine see pretty hot exhaust gas to begin with, yeah? So pointing the engine into, into the flow um, should be fine. I actually watched the, um, the corners on the, on the, um, on the nozzle, and, and they look fine. So I'm, I'm surprised on how well the engines keep up. There are details um, where we see damage, um, and we had made adjustments, I would say. That's part of the reason why we have these blocks. We basically roll in changes um, to, to, to do that and to iteratively improve the vehicle. And, and by this point in time, I must say I'm actually pretty happy. Um, I think the rocket is, 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 is really good. There are some, uh, some of the hotter re-entries, is still something that we work on to perfect them and to make sure then at the end, the goal is to take the rocket and move it over and launch again. Yeah, we, 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 have, we have the goal of launching basically within two days, um, and, and, and that would be tremendous if you do that. Uh, so many. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to pick you, and you have the microphone. <laughs> so I understand that kerosene is perhaps not the best uh, fuel to use for reusable rockets because it clogs up the engines. I was <laughs> wondering um, what experiences do you have with uh, the engines? What, what do your research yeah. show? So I mean, this is like a religion, basically, right? <laughs> which fuel you use, because at the beginning of this whole enterprise, you actually don't know what the problems are going to be in the end. In terms of kerosene, um, one of the things that's really good with kerosene is it's, it's easy to, to store, and um, it's, an, it's a cheap propellant, and, um, and it's easy to develop engines with it. Yeah? It's not, when you fuse hydrogen, now you have two cryogenics. Um, and, and we felt in the beginning this was too much of a handful. We will obviously, going forward, um, use, use other propellants when we go to Mars. You need to find something that, uh, you need to have a propellant that works on Mars. Um, methane is, is the obvious choice here. Um, so I feel a little bit with kerosene, we made a decent choice. Um, it's a pretty dense propellant. Um, it keeps the rocket small. Um, and it may have, on a system level, a good system impulse for the first stage. It may not be perfect for the second stage, but honestly, I don't think it matters too much if you have the best propellant or not, as long as you just you best scale the rocket up and down, right? Yeah. Please, um, you need to move the microphone over there. Thank you. Four and a half years ago, I reminded your former president, Mr. Barry Masmori, that oh, the twenty. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> uh, so my question is, uh, how can you dealing with the uh, uh, very complex interaction between the thirty-one uh, engines of the BFR? Because uh, the uh, the uh, the the twenty-seven engines are fucking heavy. It's are in three groups, not so serious. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't understand the question. Did you said on BFR. So for BFR, there are when many. Take the microphone away. 
Yo, <laughs> for BFR, there are more engines than Falcon Heavy. Yes. And not grouped uh, because you see the 27 engines of Falcon Heavy are in three groups with nine each. So the interactions are not so complex. Oh. For the BFR, uh, how can you solve this problem? Do, will, will you perform some ground tests oh, yeah, yeah. to ensure this? Thank so, you. So the engine interaction it was, a, was a big deal on Falcon 9 too, and we just tested it, and it's fine. So I'm saying is, what I'm saying is we will test this on a big scale, yeah? and if you see interaction, we move the engines left and right. Yeah? This obviously, there's two ways to, to deal with this problem. You can do an analysis, and, and you know, we, we do analysis to, to make sure we don't make any gross mistakes, yeah? but then in reality, we always test it before we fly, and that's actually, that's actually the more important um, parameter. On, on, um, there are certain things that you can't test, and then obviously you have to rely on analysis only. But in terms of engines, the number um, we we haven't seen too many too many problems on Falcon 9. We don't anticipate that this is going to be uh, that that much of an issue. And it's also the engines are sequenced too. Yeah? There's a, not all engines are running at the same time, so there, there's a difference. Uh, there's, there's there's engines that are used for entry, engines that are used for ascent. Yeah, so there's a little bit of more detail in there. So I, we. Do this one over there. You, when you return using the, the BFS from the moon, you come in at Mach 30. Do you anticipate any problems with their re-entry re -entry survivability? Um, I don't really anticipate a, a, um, problems because of the Mach number. The Mach number is only one factor. What counts is actually the heat flow, um, at, uh, heat flux rather, and, and that is much more dependent on um, how you how you use the vehicle in the flow basically well, how you how you put it in the flow yeah um, there's a lot of detail that needs to be worked out and um, we have experience with heat shields we um, have been flying Dragon Dragon actually is, is designed to to go around the moon and do the same thing um, which was an overkill for um, for what we do right now but on the heat shield we we felt um, we rather make it too thick and then we shave it as we, we get, um, get more experience. And I'm pretty sure we're going to do the same thing on, on, on BFS. We, we're going to start thick and then we're going, to, we're going to trim it down as we find out how much we actually use. Yeah. All right, th thank you very much. Um, appreciate your time and, uh, and have a great, uh, great conference here. <laughs>